from the heart of rural France. This is the Keto Woman podcast, brought to you by me. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight, after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. I've been keto now for over two years and it has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. Each week I'll be chatting to inspirational women maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner, right? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs under 20 grams a day. So things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like full fat dairy. Choose delicious fatty proteins and be free and easy with oily dressings on salad and butter on your veggies. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you. Make your own personalised keto. You'll hear all sorts of ways to keto from my guests. There is no one way to do keto, no one size fits all. I hope to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we really can't give you medical advice. It's always best to consult your own doctor when making big changes to your diet and lifestyle because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. Wouldn't it be helpful to have one place where you could find all the links? Want to sign up to my new Patreon exclusive Facebook group, Daisy's Lovelies? No problem. How about subscribing to my YouTube channel? Please help me notch up my first thousand subscribers by going to links.ketowomanpodcast.com and following the YouTube link. Not following me on Instagram yet? Hit the Instagram button. You get the idea. All the buttons, all the links you need are at links.ketowomanpodcast.com. Welcome to episode number 171, where I'm joined by extraordinary woman, podcast regular and carnivore doyenne, Amber O'Hearn. I wanted to do a Carnivore 101 episode, and Amber has always been my go-to for all things carnivore, so naturally I asked her to record with me again. I'm very grateful to her for sparing me so much of her time as she is super busy right now. Amber has shared her story on the podcast as well as chatting about Keto AF and other subjects. So if these two episodes, of course the recording ran long, leave you wanting more, I'll put the links in the show notes so they're easy to find. For those of you who don't already know Amber, she has been studying and experimenting with ketogenic diet since 1997 and has eaten a plant-free diet since 2009 after discovering its profound effects on her mood and cognition. She has presented at various conferences on the role of ketosis and meat-eating in brain development and evolution, her review on the evolutionary appropriateness and benefit of weaning babies onto a meat-based, high-fat, low-carb diet, was included as testimony defending Professor Tim Noakes in his infamous trial. She's a data scientist by profession, with prior publications in mathematics, linguistics and psychology. Amber is also the founder and organiser of the fantastic carnivore conference, CarnivoryCon. She's hoping it will be able to come back this year. So check out the website carnivorycon.com for updates. I always find my conversations with Amber fascinating, and I hope you would enjoy listening as much as I enjoyed recording. Welcome back, Amber, to the Keto Woman podcast. How are you doing today? Fine, thanks. Thanks for having me on again. It's so nice to talk to you. It's really nice to talk to you too. It's been a long time. Too long. I was just saying, talking about long things, how long your hair is. (laughs) There's a lot of people who who haven't cut their hair for a long, long time. You're obviously one of them. (laughs) Looks lovely. Thank you. Yes, I 
originally there was a period where I couldn't go see a hairdresser. And then after the shops opened back, I just wanted to see how, how long it would get, especially <laughs> since I didn't have to appear anywhere in person for a while, get through that awkward stage. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? Mine won't go past a certain length now. I used to have very long hair when I was younger, but it just it just starts misbehaving past a certain length. So I've just got shorter and shorter over the years. <laughs> so I was looking very <laughs> scruffy for a long time. <laughs> but yours looks nice. I like it. Thank you. So we're here to do a bit of a Carnivore 101. Give people the lowdown who are interested in starting Carnivore, maybe who've recently been giving it a go and running into a, a few problems. We'll go over a bit of troubleshooting and a few problems that people might run into as well with Carnivore. We're actually recording this before the end of the year, but it was your idea to put it out in the new year for people who might want to give Carnivore a go, maybe for a New Year's resolution. Maybe they're tightening up their dietary approach or doing an elimination diet, which it's perfect for. So, yeah, take it away. <laughs> what is carnivore? What's it good for? Why should people think about taking it on as a dietary approach? That's a great question because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what a carnivore diet is. From a certain perspective, it's just very simple. Carnivore diet is a diet where you are getting almost all or all of your food from animal sourced foods. I say almost because there is a long held tradition of people who were early into this kind of diet, like myself, who still drink coffee, for example, which is definitely a plant. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, some people talk about only getting their calories from animal sourced foods, but then that leaves open the question of, for example, spices. And we can talk more about that later. In fact, mm -hmm. I think it's important too. Yeah. But the basic idea is that you're eating only either only meat or, you know, eggs and, and dairy could count depending on your particular tolerances. What happens in practice is that, of course, this is a very low carb diet as well, as long as you're not drinking a lot of regular milk. And so it shares a lot of the same properties that you would already be getting if you're on a low carb diet, including being at least mildly ketogenic, depending on how your protein and fat ratios come out. So that means that you're, you're getting all the benefits that you'd be getting from a low carb diet. So why would you want to go further and also cut out plants? And the, the reason <laughs> that I'd give is only an empirical reason. And that is that a lot of people have found that when they do that, certain other kinds of problems that they weren't able to resolve in a low carb diet that included plants are sometimes going away. And those could be really deeply uh, important and conditions that are really affecting your life. So for example, digestive disorders are often very well improved by removing vegetables and plants from your diet. So if you have, for example, IBD or IBS or colitis, a lot of people are getting a huge benefit from a carnivore diet. Another area are autoimmune conditions. And that's very interesting because most autoimmune conditions don't have a very good treatment. It's basically you have this, you have it for life, and you're, mm. you're trying to manage it. Mm. And some people are getting a really good response, sometimes complete remission from things like asthma or arthritis in other autoimmune conditions. So that, that really gives a lot of hope, I think, for people. And that's another reason you might want to try it. And then a third one is what happened to me, and that is psychiatric disorders. So if you are struggling with something like depression or anxiety, in my case, bipolar disorder, there have been reports that maybe schizophrenia might be well affected as well. Um, now, of course, this is all just from anecdotal reports. And there's no clinical evidence to say that it could work, but <laughs> many people are finding that it's having a good effect. And so because it's a very easy treatment to try mm. and low risk, that is why I like to tell people about it because it completely changed my life and many people that I know have had similar experiences. Yes, exactly. That's the, that's the crucial thing really, isn't it? It's so easy to try. Right. Um, so I like to think about, you know, a risk benefit or a risk reward 
scenario when you're thinking about trying something that's a, a medical treatment. So obviously, if something is very costly or very risky in terms of potential side effects or unknown, then you'd be more reluctant to try it than something that is, you know, it's just just changing the way you eat and doesn't, as far as we know, have any bad effects. And we can talk about things that people might worry that it would do. And then also, if you're trying it for a short term, that also means that the effects are minimized Mm -hmm. because all you're trying to do is find out if it's going to help you and then If it does, then you have more questions you can ask. But then the benefits, so you wouldn't try something that's even mildly inconvenient if you didn't think it was going to help you at all. So the more the potential reward and the lower the the risk, the more the why not, (laughs) I guess. Exactly. And I think, I mean, I've certainly found it useful using it as an elimination diet. So if, you know, if, if it's not something even that you're thinking about doing long term, you're only approaching it from a short term point of view in trying to find out perhaps you've got some suspects when it comes to different foods that you think are affecting you. And it's a really good way of just clearing the decks, as it were, for a period of time and giving your body a rest and then testing those things. But of course, you know, some people have done that and (laughs) accidentally along the way, oh, I feel so much better for things that I had no idea were being impacted. And of course, they carry on. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, intolerances can be tricky because if you remove one thing, you might replace it with something unknowingly that you're also intolerant to. I had a friend Mm. many years ago who had a child who they suspected had food intolerances. And so one thing they did was they removed dairy and replaced it with soy milk. And only much later did they realize that he was actually sensitive to both. And so there was a long period where they didn't learn anything where they could have, unfortunately. The idea of elimination is interesting. You know, I didn't think about it this way exactly until just this moment when you were describing it. But one thing that you can do is completely remove all foods, right? So if you fast for a period, many people find that when they fast, they feel amazing. Mm. And many, I have heard, symptoms like the ones that I was describing, like arthritis, for example, would go away when fasting, but you can't fast indefinitely. And there are two properties of fasting that I think are very much like a carnivore diet. One of them is that it's ketogenic. So I think the primary benefit actually of fasting is the ketogenic aspect of it. And that's where a lot of the studies that are done about fasting come down to the benefits that you would see from just from the state of ketosis. The other one is eliminating things that may be triggering problems for you. So if you can restrict the foods that you're eating to such a degree that you're getting almost the same benefits as fasting, then you're going to maximally learn like how good can it be while doing something that is actually sustainable on a day-to-day basis indefinitely. Mm. So you can find out a lot of information without putting yourself under actually, you know, caloric and protein deprivation. So that does make it a really uniquely strong, powerful tool for learning about what affects your body. And it tells you something that if you can use it as an elimination diet, that there are very few people that it's not going to be good in that sense for. You know, I know, I know there are some people who have to, you know, only eat beef, for example, and they have problems with it, but that, you know, that's quite rare. But for most people, if they're just eating meat, they're not going to be reactive. So, I mean, it kind of tells you something generally about the carnivore diet, doesn't it? That it can be used as an elimination diet. There's, you know, the fact that those two things go together sort of tells you something that it tends to be the plant foods group that is the most problematic for the most people who have sensitivity issues. That's right. I mean, we definitely know of people who have intolerances to eggs, for example, or to seafood. Seafood is a common frank allergy, but you're right. It does seem to be far less common when you just scale back the plants. 
that seems to get the best effect. And that ties back into something I didn't go into earlier, but mentioned, which is spices. Spices and say herbs and spices are plant-based, obviously. And what happens for them is you're taking this plant and you're isolating a very strong compound Mm. that has flavors in it. And flavors are often the sources of strong chemicals within a plant. And you're isolating it and concentrating it and then putting you put it on your, in your food in in large quantities relative to how much of that compound would be there in the plant. And so even though spices don't carry any caloric value typically or just a very tiny one, I think it's a very good idea if you're trying a carnivore diet just to see how good can it get? <laughs> Is this going to help me? Spices are something that I would strongly recommend not adding at least at first. Mm. Yes, absolutely. I can remember you first saying that to me when I asked you about herbs and spices. And I mean, it's something so obvious when you think about it, that this is this a really concentrated form. And so, you know, no wonder it has such an impact on people. I've been talking recently about paprika. So it's something that's in so many things in quite a small quantity. But if you're sensitive to nightshades, you know, boom, that paprika is really going to knock you for six. Yes. And that's, I don't know what it's like where you are living, but it's very difficult where I live to get cured meats that don't have paprika in it. Mm. For some reason that that and garlic are a favorite for putting into pepperonis and salamis and yeah it's very unfortunate because i would love to be able to get cured meats that even just salt would be better <laughs> mm. um, but we get what we can get i guess yeah either that or get into making your own i guess <laughs> that's a really good idea <laughs> That's the next project. (laughs) At least there'll be a tasty one. You end up with a really nice tasty result. (laughs) Yes. So what about the rules, quote unquote, of carnivore? I've seen there's one that does the rounds a lot. There's a Venn diagram. I meant to pull it up before we started so that I could be looking at. But it's basically the kind of the various layers of carnivore. I think it might be one that overlaps with keto. So it's got that little bit down in the corner that um, everything is sort of keto and carnivore. And then there's the old uh, milk and honey bit that throws a spanner (laughs) into the works. But neither of us are big into rules. But people seem to like you've only got to go into one of the carnivore groups on Facebook and and people start talking about how they're doing carnivore and they're eating cheese or something. And then someone will come in and say that's breaking such and such a rule or, you know, what have you. (laughs) But there seem to be layers. Yeah. You know, there, there seem to be people who say that you can eat any food that's an animal source or that an animal produces which is where the milk and honey comes in. Honey in particular seems to be one of the most argued topics <laughs> when I spent any time in carnivore groups. Somebody only had to mention honey and there'd just be an, you know, an absolute furore over it. So, I mean, you know, does it matter? Does it make any difference? So the, like I say, there just seem to be these stages sort of all you know, anything that's living down to ruminants only, down to just beef? Does it matter? I'm going to be contrarian and say I really don't like this kind of layered approach. I think it's way too complex Mm. and it's... Yes, exactly. That's what it is. It just gets very complicated. (laughs) People going in, I thought this was supposed to be easy. (laughs) Not only that, but it has an implication behind it that I don't believe, and that's that there is progressive kind of... uh, improvement that you would see going through these layers. And I don't think that's necessarily true at all. There are definitely individual kinds of tolerances where you could say, yeah, for me, cutting out the dairy is better. That's an improvement, but that's not true for everybody. And (laughs) at a certain point, you've just, you know, you would have to make uh, a circle in your diagram for every individual. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That would be more to the truth, but it, it's entirely too complex. I think that the the basic idea, if you had to pin down what the rules are for best results, it would have to be low carb, I think, which completely removes that whole 
honey and milk aspect and just animal foods. And I, I really don't see any reason to go into other kinds of, I don't know, different segments of that because it's, it's just not a progression. Mm. <laughs> and I guess there are people who can tolerate milk and honey, for example, and that's fine. Milk has the property of not having all of these plant chemicals in it, which is, I think is the main goal of the carnivore diet and the main advantage that it has over just a low carb diet. So you have the plant free aspect and you have the, well, there's also the importance of getting enough animal sourced foods, which is, I think, one of the main benefits of the diet compared to, you know, a keto diet could even be vegetarian and so, mm. or even vegan. And so compared to keto, which in many ways has very few restrictions, <laughs> as long as it's producing ketones in your body, having that animal source food is important. But honey, actually, it's not a plant. Uh, it comes from animals. And so from a certain point of view, it should be classed as an animal based food. There are also some, uh, some people have argued that, that biochemically it's different enough from other kinds of sugar that it's easier for your digestion, but it does carry a lot of phytochemicals. Those are not removed from the product by the bees in the way that, for example, the phytochemicals, those plant compounds that would be eaten by ruminants, by the time you get to milk, those phytochemicals have been dealt with and detoxified. The same thing doesn't happen for honey. So oh, if you're sensitive to certain mm. phytochemicals, honey might trigger that in a different way than a milk product might. Well, actually, that makes sense because people talk a lot about using honey as a treatment for hay fever. And part of the reasoning for that is, isn't it, that you're, you're taking on a, a small amount of the, you know, you're exposing yourself to a small amount of the things that are causing the problem in the first place. I mean, I assume that's how it works. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I'm pretty sure that that's the reasoning behind that. So for the same reason that works, it doesn't sit so well in a carnivore diet. Right. Yeah, interesting. And of course, it, it, you know, there are individual tolerances. And even when it comes to spices, certain ones are going to have different. That's the, the amazing thing about plants is that each one has its own set of defenses. So plants, they can't run away. They create chemicals as a defense mechanism, but there are many, many families of these plant chemicals and each family, each individual one would have its own effects on different animals and people. And if you have sensitivities to some plant compounds and not others, then you may be able to eventually figure out, oh, I can eat nightshades, but I can't have alliums like garlic and onion, for example, or the reverse. So plants have such a diversity of these compounds, maybe the ones in honey that are coming from specific types of flowers, maybe people can handle that better and the amounts may be smaller. But if you're really talking about trying to eliminate down to animal foods, the reason would be to get rid of those compounds. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, I see it as not exactly in line with the rest of the goals of a carnivore diet, even though it has that lovely property of being something that a vegan wouldn't eat if you're <laughs> of that bent. <laughs> so basically, as long as it's, you know, it's an animal source, um, but I guess the big ones that people also experiment with cutting out are dairy because it, it seems to be a, a common thing that impacts people. I mean, I know it impacts me. I'm in denial about it. <laughs> but I know it does. I sort of get a bit of, uh, you know, sinus congestion and catarrh. It's obviously the lactose that does it because if I go down to the really sort of the lowest carb possible dairy products, it's the things that are a bit higher, you know, things like cream and cream cheese that are up in the sort of the 3% or something. If I can get down at at 1% or lower, it tends to be better. So I, I mean, I know. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I just choose to mostly ignore it because I like dairy too much. It's really interesting because dairy seems to have that property. A lot of people feel that they they either know that they feel better without dairy or they suspect that they might, but have a particularly hard time giving it up mm. uh, as opposed to like, I don't hear a lot of people say, well, I'm a carnivore, but I just have a really hard time giving up tomatoes or, you know, or some specific thing. But dairy, I don't know why. I mean, it's true that it has certain kinds of endogenous opioid-like things mm. in it. And some people think that that's why it has this kind of almost addictive property. But there are so many reasons it could be. And I'm not sure what they are yet. I just love it. <laughs> <laughs> I can certainly cut down and reduce down to almost even just butter. Butter's that sort of, <laughs> butter's the last stand. It's the thing that I really struggle with giving up the most. But yes, I know. I know I get a bit mucusy with any kind of dairy, really. And I probably would be better without it completely. But again, it's that, it's just that balance, isn't it? Where you decide the, the pleasures you have in life. And on the other hand, the, you know, the potential disadvantages that they bring and, and you have to make those decisions. The thing about butter is it's a, a really good source of fat and it can be a challenge to get enough fat in a carnivore diet just because in our society, the fat from the meat is often trimmed way down mm. compared to what it could be. And so if you're just supermarket shopping and you're getting the kind of meat that people would normally be eating with a lot of carbohydrates, then it's going to have more protein per calorie, I guess, is the way you would think about it here, than you would want if you wanted to keep the protein at a sort of medium level and, and put all your calories based on fat. If you're doing keto, you can have, you know, salad dressings, a lot of olive oil, things like that become something that people lean on a lot. But with, with carnivore, you don't have those vegetable oil options. And I think that makes it a lot more of a challenge for people with dairy in particular on a carnivore diet if they want to give it up. It's partly, I think, something that will happen naturally because humans have a, a difficulty when they start eating too high protein, it won't feel good. Um, people can feel, um, nauseated or tired or have diarrhea even if they eat too high level of protein. And usually what happens is that they'll naturally start wanting more fat. And so if you can get it from the meat, that's ideal. But you have to, you have to start seeking out sources where there's a lot of fat left on it or incorporate things like uh, rendered fat, which is sometimes a challenge for digestion, mm -hmm. but you can add tallow or use drippings and or use cooking methods that allow you to reserve some of the fat. So when you're cooking burgers, for example, a lot of fat gets rendered out. And if you're doing it in a pan, you can just pour it back on. But if you're grilling, you can't. It's an interesting thing that uh, someone shared in my Facebook group, Carolina shared. She was like, why did I not know this before? That apparently, and I mean, I guess it depends on the lard in question, but a tablespoon of lard actually provides 500 to 1,000 international units of vitamin D. So a, a fantastic source for that, especially it must have come up in her reading, I imagine, because of the, the focus that has been put on vitamin D during COVID and the, you know, the links that there seem to be between the two. And she was, how did I not know that, uh, yes, lard seems to pack a punch when it comes to vitamin D? Well, it's interesting because a lot of databases don't reflect that. Hmm. And I'm not sure if that's because of different samples. Obviously, the animal's going to get the vitamin D from being outside in sunshine in part. Um, and so if they're not raised that way, that might limit the vitamin D to lower levels. But also I think there may be just issues of the database uh, organizers deciding not to measure it because they're also not thinking of it as a source. But, you know, when you think about it, we know that there are certain vitamins that are 
fat soluble. Mm. <laughs> and that's where we're going to find them. So A and D and K in some cases is going to be in the animal fat. And it's actually a really important source <laughs> when you're, when you're not eating foods that are fortified the way that milk would be, for example. That's right. Now you mentioned the other one that a, a lot of people struggle with giving up and I don't know many carnivores who don't still drink coffee. <laughs> ah. So that's just, I guess that's just going to come down to A, being one of the quote unquote rules that is most commonly broken when adopting carnivore as a way of eating, but also presumably just again comes down to an individual tolerance. And it might be that if you have, if you're approaching carnivore from an elimination diet point of view, it might be worth at least at some point cutting out the coffee to see if it does negatively impact you. But I know that's another one that's right up there at the top of the list that people are just, no, cannot give it up, including you, of course. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm of at least two minds about this. So the reason that I started with drinking coffee is kind of historical. So when I came, when I found the zero carb diet is what we were calling it at that time. It was just considered that you didn't necessarily need to give it up. It wasn't so much a rule as, oh, we, we know people who didn't. There are many people among us who didn't, and we still got all these benefits. And so it didn't really occur to me that it might be important to give up coffee when I started. And then I got all these benefits. So the, the weight that I had gained while on low carb very quickly started going down. And, and the, of course, the mood disorder problem was the, the big one for me. And so, so then I just kept doing what I was doing and it didn't occur to me until later. Well, you know, if the problem really is plants and at first I was really reluctant to believe that it was, I thought that even though I knew <laughs> The name notwithstanding, the name zero carb notwithstanding, everyone knew that what we meant was get rid of the plants and eat only animal foods. But I wasn't thinking of coffee as a plant food, even though it's obviously full of phytochemicals. <laughs> uh, so it did, of course, occur to me at, at a certain point when I really had gotten on board that it is something about plants that was the problem and not just carbohydrates. And I have eliminated coffee from my life Numerous times, actually, over the years, the 11 years now that I've been carnivore, uh, the longest time was for a period of three months, a couple of summers ago, just to make sure that there weren't more benefits that I was depriving mm -hmm. myself of by continuing this drug addiction. That's <laughs> <laughs> basically what it is. And I didn't find any additional benefit, much to my relief. So, yeah. like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> interestingly for me, I can't drink tea, regular tea. Because, well, for whatever reason, when I drink black tea or green tea, it causes my face to flush. I had rosacea. It was one of the things that went away when I was on carnivore. There are many types of rosacea. The type that I had is just your face turns completely red and it, and it stays <laughs> that way for, for a prolonged time. I used to, people used to always comment on my sunburn and it was just so embarrassing <laughs> when my face would be so red. And, and that went away when I, when I drop the plants, but certain triggers will bring it back. And one of them is tea. And one of them is actually decaf coffee hmm. of all things. Interesting. I do not know why, but regular coffee is not a problem for me. Now, if, if I hadn't gone through that experience and had come across the carnivore diet later when from more the point of view of what I know now about, about plants and their potential for triggering some kind of immune, I guess, problem is what it comes down to. I would probably advise people to cut out the coffee if I didn't know that I and other people have found it generally to be quite tolerable. And it does have real benefits. I mean, it stimulates ketosis, for example, if that's something that's important for you therapeutically. So it's a drug. And that also means that if you're going to try a carnivore diet, it adds a layer of complexity because if you just dropped coffee at the same time that you started everything else, you would go through obvious withdrawals that 
would make it difficult to figure out what to attribute what to. So that would be another argument for not dropping coffee right away mm -hmm. when you start a carnivore diet. But of course, you know, if you, if you tried a carnivore diet and you weren't getting results that you were hoping for, it's definitely something you could try because it is a drug and it's going to have effects. Or exactly the same as your experience. You know, you, you carry on including coffee and you really find that you like the carnivore diet. And then at some point you think, well, I, I you know, I'll test the coffee and see if things couldn't be even better. Right. That, you know, that sounds like a, a very sensible plan to me. One thing that I, that I do recommend is that you stop drinking alcohol because that can, that can be a conflation as well. And uh, presuming that you aren't drinking alcohol to the point where stopping it would be dangerous, then it seems like that's a fairly easy thing to do. If it's not easy, uh, if you find that the thought of giving up alcohol for a few weeks is actually very difficult, that might be a point for self-reflection. So are you saying that that's something ideally that is eliminated from a carnivore diet? completely yes forever or just when you're starting well at least when you're starting because i think that it can have a, i mean it has effects on for example intestinal permeability it has effects on mood disorders i have found that it's a common theme that alcohol and its effects on mood can be quite severe in certain cases. And so if you're trying to find out if the carnivore diet is going to help you, then drinking alcohol may really be a disruptor to finding out that information. I didn't have any alcohol for the first five years. Yeah, five years that I was carnivore because I, well, I started without it. I had bipolar and my doctor had advised me not to touch any alcohol. He thought it would be very bad for the bipolar disorder. And so I avoided it completely and it didn't it didn't occur to me to try it again until much later. And and I thought, well, I was in a situation where I could enjoy some alcohol and I thought, why not try it? I've been stable. My mood has been stable for five years and I'll know pretty quickly if this is going to be bad for me. And mm. if it is, I can just stop again. <laughs> and I found to my pleasant surprise that it didn't seem to have a terrible effect on my mood either, except that I think it's, it's a matter of degree. And there was a period after I discovered that alcohol was going to be okay, that I started drinking too much, I think. And uh, it took me some time to realize that I'd gone a little bit too far in that direction. Drugs are really interesting in that way. <laughs> exactly. They can really creep up on you, I think, in terms of use. Um, even coffee for me, if I don't monitor myself, my level of coffee intake will just go up and up mm. and up and up. Yes, I found that too. I do have, I'm fairly self-limiting because if I carry on drinking past a certain time of day and past a certain number of cups, I mean, I literally just start getting twitchy, but it, the number of cups I have is sort of creeping up a little more and a little more. So it definitely does seem to work that way. I assume with carnivore, the same as a lot of people on keto find that alcohol just hits you a lot harder as well. Yes, that's an interesting thing because um, it was unexpected to me and I found <laughs> when I did start drinking again, at first I thought, oh, well, of course I have a really low tolerance because I haven't had anything to drink for five years. And there was one time where I had an event coming up where I knew that there would be a lot of drinking going on. And I thought, well, I'm going to build up my tolerance for this <laughs> event, <So> that, <laughs> which is kind of a silly <laughs> thing to even imagine. Um, <laughs> and so I tried for like a week leading up to this event to improve my tolerance. And I was, I was absolutely unable to, and I started looking into it more. And I think that the reason that that is, is that there are detoxification pathways in the liver that are used up. Um, the enzymes are used in a different way when you're on a ketogenic diet, oh, such that you don't have as much availability ah. to, 
detox the alcohol. How interesting. Yes, I mean, because basically there's, it's not really one of these things that it can be argued that it's good for you at all. It's basically just a toxin that you're, I mean, that's why your body prioritizes, doesn't it? Alcohol is the first thing it metabolizes. Yes. Because it's got to get rid of it. <laughs> it's the most yeah. toxic thing. So it's top of the list to to get rid of. Yeah, get that out of there. I mean, there are epidemiological types of arguments. You know, there's some like ideal amount of alcohol to have per day that seems to correlate better with longer life. But, you know, we don't want to take epidemiological arguments too seriously because they could have to do with correlations that have nothing to do with the alcohol itself, for example. Although they might. I mean, it's quite possible that like half an ounce a day is actually better for you than none, mm. but who knows? Yeah, I'm certainly dubious of that one. I do like to have, a, you know, a drop or two every now and then, especially when it's being sociable. But again, I know I do better without it. Um, and I, I think probably most people do too. Again, it's this balance, isn't it? Especially when it, it's around, as you just mentioned, building that tolerance around social events. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, you know, that has an importance in and of itself. That's a really good point because when you find yourself in a regime that is very strict and that excludes things that are normally associated with pleasure – then you, you have to find some balance and no one can choose that balance for you. And no one can say that your choice is right or wrong. That's very individual, but it is a choice that I think needs to be made with, with knowledge. You have to know what you're trading off. Right. I think pleasure is really important. And I would never have been able to stick with a carnivore diet if I didn't find the food inherently very pleasurable. And also if it didn't happen that my cravings for sugar and plant foods completely disappeared. But I do think this is a difference, maybe a cultural difference between, for example, veganism and carnivore. If a vegan, I think because it's an ethical decision, then having some kind of excursion that would be based on pleasure would be considered to be not, not an acceptable trade-off. Whereas if you're a carnivore and you, it's really important to you for the pleasure of your life or for some reason to have some plant involving <laughs> kind of food for some reason, that's, I think that's, that's totally up to you. What you need to know is just what am I going to pay for that? And if you're not paying very much for it or if you decide that it's worth it, that's, that's a personal decision. Yes, that's very interesting, actually. It's such a, a big part of why most people, not all, but most people who adopt a vegan lifestyle, it's the ethical element that's, that's the thing that's of paramount importance. So there's, there's almost not a, not necessarily a pleasure in denial, but denying yourself of things that you enjoy is kind of a big part of it for the bigger, better purpose, reason, you know, however you want to express it. Right. But most vegans, you know, would admit that they miss bacon, for example, but they deprive themselves of it because it's more important for them not to eat animals than it is to indulge in their pleasure for bacon. Yes. And in fact, I've heard people who are criticizing those who eat meat, I've often heard it said, oh, you're just doing that for your own pleasure. And you're not the implication being you're selfishly taking on pleasure without considering enough how it affects the rest of the world. Mm. Whereas in the, in the carnivore sense of, of cheating, I guess, <laughs> it's more about, you know, I'm doing this because it has a certain effect on my health. And so I'm going to make a very calculated decision about what I'm willing to, how far I'm willing to diverge from that based on what it does to my body. And there really isn't much else going on in that calculation mm. and there's a very you know it's a, a sweeping generalization about vegans i know <laughs> i know people who've landed uh, carrie dilutus is always the person i quote as arriving at veganism via carnivore <laughs> 
looking for the best approach for her health. And so, you know, there are people like that who I find fascinating. You know, carnivore was her first thought. This is what's going to work for me. This is what's going to help with my health issues and was quite surprised to find that it didn't and equally as surprised to find that eating a vegan lifestyle did. So, you know, all, we end up where we end up through all sorts of interesting pathways, don't we? That's true. In We don't have this distinction quite as well nailed down in English, I think. Um, usually, when I hear the word vegan, I'm thinking about people who are doing it for reasons other than health, whereas they might use a word like whole food plant based or something like that if they really want to emphasize that this is, this is a health consideration. But it's, it's not as well defined in French. I think they have two different words, vegan and vegetalien or vegetalien and vegetarian. I'm, <laughs> I don't remember exactly what the French words are, but, mm -hmm. um, it's an important distinction and yeah, I definitely, I definitely don't want to characterize everyone the same or say that people uh, are all thinking about it the same way. It's just something that comes up a lot in a very stereotypical type of interaction. No, absolutely. And I think it's, I think it's very interesting. I think we're both very interested in the way people think about these things. Absolutely. And mindset and behaviors and, and how all that gets involved. But we're going off on a little bit of a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> it's so easy to do, isn't it, when you get into these conversations? Absolutely. The other thing I wanted to ask you about in that sort of list of, of things is salt. Ah. You know, how important it is. A lot of people, again, when you go into these groups, you know, salt is of paramount importance. You need it. And other people who say uh, when they're eating carnivore, they they either find they don't need it anymore or, you know, whatever. I, and we've had a bit of a discussion about it before and, and wondered whether partly, again, it's a little bit like maybe why it comes up in the keto conversation as well, that it's it's often really important and not just salt, but actually, but other electrolytes in that transition phase. Yes, I do have a lot of opinions about that. Um, you know, for me with salt, it started out historically kind of similar to the coffee thing, except in the opposite direction. So when my idea, my conception of what it was going to look like to go on a zero carb diet was to have no seasonings at all, including flavorings like salt. And so I started the carnivore diet. I gave up everything that I was adding to the meat and it was I tell you, it was kind of bland for the first week or so, but I quickly adapted, actually. My taste buds very quickly adapted to not salting my food, and I began to appreciate, actually, the taste of meat, and I just never went back, and because my taste had adapted, I now find that if I eat at a restaurant, it always tastes too salty to me. I never want to add salt to my own food, and bacon, I find almost almost impossible to eat mm, because of the level of, of salt on it. Unless I put like, I'll mix it in a bite with some meat so that I have a bit of bacon and a bit of steak or something like that. Yeah. So I was going to ask you actually that that was going to be a follow on about sort of processed and, and cured meat. So I guess it comes into the same conversation with salt. Yeah. So I'm not alone in this from that era. There are many people that I know who are long-term carnivores who also don't eat any salt and have the same experience as me on that front. Uh, even some more recent carnivores that I know. Um, there are others who do salt to taste, but I think a couple of years ago, there was this surge in appreciation for salt, <laughs> which is really interesting. It's obviously very helpful during a transition, as you mentioned, when you're transitioning into a ketogenic metabolism, because salt is lost and, and it can be really important to replace those electrolytes. But whether it's important to continue adding electrolytes after may depend on, on different factors. And I know that there are a lot of people who are on ketogenic diets who really find that they feel better adding a lot of salt, but it doesn't seem to be true for everyone. And as we've discussed before, I think it, it depends and is interacts with, for example, how much you're drinking. And I think this might be a different cultural thing 
between keto and carnivore specifically because when you're on keto, you may drink flavored drinks that you wouldn't if you're on carnivore. So if you're on carnivore and you're giving up everything that has plant extracts, Mm -hmm. except maybe coffee, which is actually a bit dehydrating, you might drink less just because drinking those flavored drinks might just encourage you to drink more because you're enjoying them. Absolutely. Or the other thing that might come into play is just um, enculturated ideas about needing to hydrate a lot for health reasons. So if you're on keto and you're, you're really pumping back the fluid either purposely or because you're enjoying this, this is like your last bastion of a sweet taste, your diet Pepsi or whatever it is. Now you're drinking a lot more fluid and that may cause you to actually need more salt than you would if you were only drinking water to thirst and it comes out to be a very small level, which is the case for me. And then the last component that I think might have something to do with differences between ketogenic and carnivore salt needs is that there's at least some evidence that more minerals are needed to detoxify plant compounds. This is why herbivores go to salt licks, Mm, for example, and other mineral licks. Mm. There's even evidence that animals who who eat more vegetables, not vegetables, but plant sources in different seasons, during the seasons that they're eating more plants, they will visit mineral licks more often. And it's Mm. supposed to have the function for that is to be able to detoxify. So if that's the case, it may be that carnivores just need less sodium because they have less of that burden of detoxification. Yes, I mean, I've certainly found a a similar thing on keto. You know, I I often see it given as a, a prescriptive amount of salt you're supposed to have every day. And it's certainly something that I suggest for people if they're, you know, there's kind of a particular list of symptoms, isn't there, that salt is something that is worth trying to remedy those problems. However, I've experimented at various times with taking salt prescriptively like that. And again, it's just anecdotally, but I've seen no difference at all. Um, So I, you know, I, I literally use it to taste. Right. I, you know, I sort my food as as much or as little as I would like to eat, but I've I've certainly seen no difference in you know adding the the typical one and a half to two teaspoons a day. I agree. There are certain telltale signs that might suggest that you're not getting enough salt, and I don't think there's any harm in taking more salt necessarily. Although some people have reported actually getting benefit from removing it. There's actually lately a no salt challenge going down in certain carnivore groups yeah, because of awareness of this. And, and some people, of course, chime in and say, no, absolutely. I feel much worse when I remove the salt. And other people are saying, wow, I've had all this swelling that hasn't gone away. And when I got rid of the salt, it went down. And, and so different responses. I, I'm very, Curious to see what the different results people will get now that they're trying that in a more explicit way. But salt, you know, it's not, it's definitely not even a, <laughs> a plant food. There's no, I don't think there's a reason to worry if you find that more salt makes you feel better. I don't, I don't think that there's necessarily a downside. And one thing that I think has been really great in the last several years is more awareness of the realization that salt has been really falsely maligned in medicine. Mm. And I think, yeah, it's a phrase that you hear a lot to taste. But I think actually it's something that we should pay a lot more attention to. You know, I was just thinking about when you were talking about the different seasons and how animals go to the salt licks more. And I was thinking of myself how I carry a bit of, I uh, carry some salt around with me when, especially when I'm gardening in the summer when it's very hot. And, you know, I find, and it's obvious, you know, if you're sweating a lot, you're losing more salt, but the taste is different. So you literally, you know, you, you uh, wet your finger, dip it in the salt and taste it. Well, that's going to taste very different on a really hot summer's day when you've been sweating a lot than it is in the middle of winter. 
But that tells you something, you know, if you get a craving for it or if it doesn't taste as salty, sounds like a silly thing to say, but I I think you probably know what I mean. Yeah. And the fact that we have taste receptors for salt at all seems like there's an important thing for us to know there. (laughs) So I did say that when I stopped eating salt, my taste buds adapted so that things taste salty. And I think that's one component of it. But I really do think that our needs fluctuate and that our taste buds really help us to understand what we need. Mm. And that, if you don't mind, is kind of a good segue into a question that comes up a lot, which is about eating organ meats. There's a huge controversy. Oh, perfect. That's yes. The next one on my list. (laughs) (laughs) So there's a huge controversy over whether and to what degree you should be eating Nose to tail is the phrase, uh, whether you should be eating organ meats when you're on a carnivore diet. And I think when most people are talking about organ meats, what they really mean is liver. Although there are many different organs that provide different kinds of nutrient profiles. And it's a little bit myopic to focus only on liver. But but in practice, that's what we're talking about. And, and so I think it's, it's important to talk about because <laughs> the carnivore diet can provide all essential nutrients. That's a really interesting thing to find out. I think most people don't think about meat as a source of vitamins and minerals. They think about meat as being a source of protein. When in the wider world, that's what people think of meat as providing is protein. But in fact, it does have a lot of nutrients and all nutrients that you need can be provided without eating any plants at all. However, if you're trying to meet the RDAs and you look at how much of each nutrient you need and you want to make that nutrient um, level by eating a carnivore diet, organ meats, liver in, in specific, is the is one of the reasons that you can just glibly say, yes, you can get all of your required nutrients from a carnivore diet. And if you don't include the liver, then there are several nutrients that that it might be a lot harder to get in terms of RDA. Now, I have talked a lot in the past about questioning RDAs Mm. because there are different reasons why RDAs might change if you're not incorporating plant foods. For Just for a brief example, the phytates, the plant compounds that are in grains and legumes, have a huge effect, a negative effect on mineral absorption. So it's very plausible to me that if you remove all grains and legumes from your diet, the amount of zinc, for example, that you would need should probably be much lower than the RDA, which was established (laughs) with that interference (laughs) uh, on board as an assumption. But the other thing about liver is that it has some nutritional compounds in such high amounts that it might actually be not good for you. And the main two that that come up with that are vitamin A and and copper. And so the reason that this links back to the idea of eating to taste is that I've experienced, and I've talked to some other people who have experienced this as well, periodic times where I just really want some liver. It sounds really good to me. And so I'll buy liver, either, you know, cow or calf or chicken is a very mild tasting, delicious kind of liver. And I'll cook a bunch of it and I'll eat it and it's delicious. And then after a couple of days, it just doesn't, the idea is completely unappealing and I don't want any more at all. And I really do think that this is a bodily response telling me that I, that I have enough. Vitamin A is funny because a lot of people will protest profusely that you cannot overdose on vitamin A from animal foods and that the only examples that we have of, well, definitely the only examples that we have of acute vitamin A poisoning come from either supplements, which have a high dose, or polar bear liver, which is one of the animals that concentrates a lot of vitamin A in the liver. It's it's 200 times the amount approximately is what you would find in, say, beef liver. Wow. And one serving of it is enough to kill you. Hmm. <laughs> But that means, you know, so it's funny because it's tricky. Our livers, 
serve as a kind of storage for different things, including vitamin A. So that means that you can eat more than your body would be able to handle because your liver can store some. And that's why liver is a good source of vitamin A. <laughs> but on the other hand, it can only store so much before it starts coming out and causing problems like if you exceed the storage capacity. So if you look at studies where they're trying to determine how much vitamin A you can eat and have it be safe, all of those studies have to have a time limit. And so you can say, well, we gave this much vitamin A for this many days, and it never caused any symptoms of toxicity. So that means that much a day is a safe upper limit. But I think that that can be a little bit misleading, because you could have only a little bit too much, so that you're not getting any symptoms, but that it's causing a little bit more to be stored in your liver. And eventually, mm. you're going to reach that limit. The cumulative effect. Yeah. So I don't think I, recently, because of the the concern for this among carnivores, that they need to make sure that they're getting all of their nutrients. There's been this huge upsurge in popularity of trying to eat liver more often, even among people who don't like it. People are encouraging themselves, I guess, to, and sometimes encouraging others to eat it, even when your taste is saying, no, I don't want it anymore because you have to, because it's good for you. And there's a bit of a conflation between it not tasting good because it's strong tasting and a lot of people just don't like it in the first place versus, you know, I normally like liver, but right now it's not appealing to me. And it's very tricky to try to draw that line. So now we have people who are selling liver supplements or people who are just really wanting to be conscientious, which is great <laughs> about their nutritional intake, who are eating more liver than they normally, than would normally occur. And I'm worried that this is a setup for problems of chronic vitamin A toxicity that are not to the point of causing acute problems and may be underdiagnosed and underrecognized. Mm, that's fascinating. Here's where we leave you for this week. Make sure to tune back in next time for more about carnivore, including some troubleshooting tips. To get the resources and links from this show, please go to ketowomanpodcast.com forward slash episodes. Please share this podcast with as many people as possible by sharing one of my links or just taking a screenshot of an episode that you enjoyed. Reviews really help raise the profile of the podcast, which gets it in front of more people, but also helps me attract a wide variety of guests. So please take a minute to leave a review on whichever podcast app or platform you like to listen on. It doesn't go unnoticed by me, the people who regularly like, share and comment on my posts. Your support really does mean the world to me. Thank you. Are you enjoying this podcast? Help me make more episodes and videos by making a pledge at my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Keto Woman, or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman podcast website. Don't forget to join in the fun on the Keto Woman podcast Instagram and Facebook pages and Daisy underscore Keto Woman on Twitter. Are you my next extraordinary woman? Maybe you've got an idea for a show, a topic you would like to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. This week's end quote is from Lucille Clifton. What they call you is one thing. What you answer to is something else. Bye-bye, Keto lovelies.